Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. And uh, tonight we're going to be primarily focusing on the 24th Psalm. So if you do want to go ahead and, and flip in your Bibles, and we will actually be looking at a few other verses and, and going back and forth a little bit in the Scripture. But primarily what we're going to be doing is looking at the 24th Psalm. So if you'll just kind of keep your finger in there if we go to any other Scriptures, because that is going to be our primary text for the evening. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to understand about any psalm and its authorship, because before you start delving into the symbolism and the poetry of it, I think that it's important that you ask about sort of the environment in which the psalm itself was crafted. So we don't know a lot about this psalm, but there are some important details that we do need to remember. First of all, it was written by King David. And as someone who authored many of the psalms in the book of Psalm we do understand that he, as the king, was somebody who had sort of a poetic soul, and this is something that he passed on to his son Solomon. And a lot of the books of poetry in the Old Testament, of course, are written by either David or Solomon. And so that's something to remember. And we believe, based on some historical context, that this psalm was probably penned after he was already king and had been for some time. So this is not something that he wrote uh, presumably as a younger man when he was on the run from King Saul. This is probably something after he's been established as the king at least for some time. And there's a couple indications that we have for that. And the reason primarily is that this was probably written for the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Zion when it was captured by the enemy. And we know the, this story well. When it was captured by the enemy... And David was able to recapture it and return it to its rightful place. This was probably a psalm that coincided with that because of the way that it's written. And, and there's some indications that this was something that was done. This was a song that was sung to celebrate the return of the ark to its rightful place amongst God's people. And so because of that, that really does help us understand a little bit better why this song was taken. And this is something that was not an uncommon practice. It was actually very common, and we see this all throughout the Psalms, that David would write a psalm for a specific occasion or a specific purpose. One thing that was a tradition that we know that took place thousands of years after David's death, for example, is that there were specific psalms that were sung in the Ascension. A psalm of ascension, uh, ascension, when they were going up the mountain into Jerusalem, for example, on festivals like Passover, that's a tradition that carried on with the Jewish faith centuries and centuries after David passed away. And so a lot of these psalms are written for a very specific purpose, and this appears to be one of those. And this one would have been something very specific, not an annual event or even an event that happened more than once a year, like the ones that we just gave an example of. This is probably specifically for when the ark has been retaken and when it ascends back to its rightful place amongst God's people. So let's go ahead and get into the text here this evening. Psalm chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Now, if this text sounds familiar to you, it may be because there actually is a hymn that we modeled after this psalm. It's called, Who, Sh who Shall Stand Before the King? And so if you've ever heard it, you probably recognize the wording here. The, the words were borrowed specifically from this psalm of David. So why does it start out a song about the Ark of the Covenant? At least that's what we believe is, is the reason that it was written. A psalm about the Ark of the Covenant, why would that start out with a theme of establishing God's ownership of the world? Right, and this is something that should not seem uncommon to us because if we've done any study in the Psalms, you know that regardless of what the subject matter of the Psalm actually is, it's not uncommon to start out with a praise of God. And yes, right, and that's an important point and I think something significant because we see this in, in other Psalms of David as well, that even though it is both in the law of, of God and it is stated in the covenant, that the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of, Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is, is seen as God's dwelling place, that God's presence is with the Ark of the Covenant. David is also recognizing that 
yes, in a sense, his presence is with the Ark of the Covenant, but God is the owner of the entire earth. And while the Ark of the Covenant was important in Jewish law and important to the, the Jewish people, he also recognizes that it is universal, that God is everywhere and he is omniscient. And I think that's one thing that he's kind of paying homage to. And, and like we were saying before, it's not uncommon at all for a psalm or a prayer to start out with the praise of God. We even recognize this in, for example, the Lord's Prayer. How does Jesus start out that prayer? Hallowed be thy name. And so a praise of God is a pretty common way to start out a psalm, regardless of what the subject matter is. But, but like you were pointing out, there was some significance also, too, to this being a recognition of God's ownership of the earth, even though in the Jewish tradition he dwells between the cherubims in the Ark of the Covenant, he also is everywhere and he owns the entirety of the earth. So when we're talking about God's ownership, let's think about this for a second. And by the way, this is not a trick question. I know sometimes when teachers ask questions, they, they seem too easy. It's not a trick question. Why does God own the earth? Because I think there's more than one possible answer here. Okay, he made it. Anything else? Okay, he's greater than it. He's supernatural. The earth exists in the natural realm. That's part of it. Anything else? Right. He sustains it. So what we're looking at here... There are several reasons that God is the owner of the earth, that God is not only the creator who founded the mountains and the rivers and the land and all of these things that David is ascribing to God in Psalm 24, he is also somebody that maintains it. And believe it or not, even in in certain legal circles, whether or not you're technically the owner of an object, the fact that you maintain an object, the fact that you do maintenance or sustain it or whatever else, is actually another way that that people can determine ownership as well. And so the fact that a person maintains a a house or a vehicle, for example, um, that that can actually be something that determines whether or not it is one person's property or another. And so God has ownership of the earth not only because he made it, but also because he sustains it. And the reason that the earth and the universe and everything else continues on on the process, the natural process, that it continues to do is because God is the one that set that in motion. And he is the one that constantly sustains it in the manner in which we know it today. And why do you think that it's so incredibly important that we really understand this and grasp this concept? Why is David reassuring his readers of that? Okay, there's an aspect of remembering that we're supposed to be subject to God, subject to his will. We saw specifically in the verse that we were looking at that it not only says that God owns the land and and the sea and everything else, it also says, and those that dwell in the earth. So he owns the earth and he also owns us. And so that should establish a foundation of the ownership of ourselves and the reason that we ought to remain in subjection to him and his will. Any other thoughts on that? Certainly, and that's a theme that we see recurring often throughout the parables of Christ, isn't it? That we see that there is this idea that we as humans are mere stewards of the things that God has given to us. We see it in the parable of the talents. We see it in the parable of the vineyard keepers that wind up killing the vineyard owner's son. This is something that is not just present in the Psalms and in the Old Testament, but it's also present in the New as well. This idea that while we may hold claim over a piece of land or physical possessions while we reside here on earth, that ultimately part of the reason it is important for us to understand that we only have these things because of the blessings of God, and he is the one that made it and allow us to take care of it for a time, I think that does change our perspective when we look at our physical blessings and our physical possessions that we are keenly aware of and remember that those things are only ours for a temporary amount of time and that we only have them because in some way they serve God's purpose. And I think that's something that David understood. David was a man of great wealth. And at this point, he had been the king for a while now, so he was accustomed to having a lot of physical possessions. He was also accustomed to, in a sense, owning a kingdom. 
but he didn't really own it. He saw himself as a steward of that kingdom, and he had, because of that, a responsibility to run it the way that God would approve of. So that's one of the reasons that uh, he owns the church. Because we look at his ownership of the earth, why did we say that he owns the earth? Because he made it and he sustains it? Well, why does he own the church? Because he made it and he sustains it? Is that not also true? That the church is founded on the bedrock of his son and the sacrifice that he made for us. And so even though he did make the church and he is the one that sustains the church and goodness knows that he is kept his church and his gospel going much longer than it probably should have if it didn't have his assistance. We also need to remember that he owns the church in a way that he doesn't necessarily own the earth. And what I mean by that is, even though he owns both of them, he didn't really purchase the earth. He did actually purchase the church. And the price of that purchase was his own son's life. And so I think that there's a parallel that we can draw here looking at this psalm that when we're looking at God's ownership of the earth, that we can also look at that as a way for us to remember that he owns the church and owns us in a even more significant way than he owns the earth as well. There's an extra layer there because his church is like the mountain or the land that is described in this passage. He's saying that it essentially sets on the foundation of the rivers. Well, what would that do if, if God were not there maintaining it? It sort of implies that there is a maintaining process going on there. That because he set it on this foundation, because he wants the land there, and because it is setting upon the floods or the rivers, depending on your translation, that he allows it to stay there. So even the earth itself, the reason that we even have a place to live or to stand on is because God wills it. Let's look at the next couple verses in verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. So, why the shift? Why has he all of a sudden made this change from discussing God's ownership and praising him for that, and now he's focusing on God's servants, not God himself. Why the, the change there? Right, and that was something that somebody that is reading this that comes from a Jewish background and has spent his whole life living by the law of Moses would readily understand that there is this process by which the priest must follow. They don't only have to clean themselves, they have to clean their clothes. And in the example that you use with Nadab and Abihu, what presumably was their big sin was that they presented strange fire to the Lord. And part of the reason that the people speculate, but I, I think that there's good reason to believe this, is that part of that is they were also intoxicated. Because it seems weird to go into this lesson about worshiping correctly and doing the right thing according to God's will with the, with the fire and, and only taking fire from a certain place and then launch into this random lesson about being intoxicated. So it seems as though the reason for that, the rationale behind those two being butted up against each other is that perhaps Nadab and Abihu had also been spiritually unclean in a sense because they had been flippant about the worship of God, not really taking it seriously, and perhaps even shown up drunk in their, before performing their duties as priests before the Lord. And so this theme of being sanctified I think coincides with the theme of God's ownership as well. And the reason that he chose to start this out is to remember that who God is. Because God is our creator. He is the one that sustains the very earth that we live on. And as such, we should never be flippant in approaching him. That these servants that are going to worship him, that are going to be the ones in charge of returning the ark to its rightful place need to remember who God is and what he can do. And because of that, there is a level of awe and reverence that should come over them for having this amazing responsibility of caring for the Ark of the Covenant. So who is worthy to be in God's presence according to this scripture? What are the qualifications? 
Right. So there was specifically when we're looking at, at this verse, there are these qualifications that are given that are not too dissimilar from the priest and the Levites, which would have been the ones carrying the ark to its rightful place as well. And so the qualifications that are given specifically in this verse that we see are clean hands, a pure heart, and no deceit or vanity. So there is this aspect that you're talking about with the Jewish law that they must be physically prepared, that they must be physically cleansed before taking on this amazing responsibility to return the ark to its rightful place. But I want you to notice that that is mentioned first, but everything else is more concerned with spiritual purity. That yes, the physical purity is important, and that is a part of Hebrew law, and because God commanded it, his people were expected to adhere to it. But there's also this aspect that we're talking about here that you also have to have a pure heart. It's not enough to be like Christ described the Pharisees to appear clean on the outside, but inside be filled with death and deceit and sin. You also have to have a spiritual preparation to come before God in this way. And he also describes the no deceit or vanity. I think that, that that's important because it's describing someone that is pure in both deeds and intent. What's the significance of the hand? Well, the hand is how you do things, isn't it? And that's what we think of when we, we think about the symbolic nature of a hand. A hand is an instrument that we use to accomplish tasks. It is something that we use to do whatever it is we need to do in our daily life. But it's not enough just to have clean hands. It's not enough just to have pure deeds. I mean, that's good. It is a good starting place for sure. But you also have to have pure intent. Not just the deeds themselves that you do are good, but also the reason that you're doing them is acceptable to God. The reason that you're doing them is pure and good and you are doing them specifically to please him. So there is the aspect of both physical purity and spiritual purity here. Right, and that would be the pure intent that we're talking about, that you're not doing this for glory or for honor. And of course, this would have been a big honor, would it not? If you were one of the priests chosen to serve in the capacity of returning the ark to its rightful place. That is a big honor and a big responsibility. But it's also important for us to remember that that can't be the reason that you're doing it. You need to be doing it not to bring honor to yourself, but to bring honor to God. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about there when, when it comes to the intent, that you have to take the focus off of yourself and put it on God. You're exactly right on that. And I also think that, that this passage points out God will not tolerate dishonesty before him because in a couple of different ways it, it points this out that you cannot be deceitful and you also cannot be vain. And I think this is where human beings as, in general can fall into quite a few traps because we cannot serve God if we lie to others but we also cannot serve God if we lie to ourselves. And this really ties into this theme of sanctification that we're talking about here. Because this is true throughout the biblical narrative, and I'm sure that every single one of us in here have experienced this in our personal lives as well. How many times could we have avoided temptation if we had been honest with ourselves? I want you to think about that. Because regardless of what the sin is, one of the most effective means of temptation the devil has to use against us is to get us to deceive ourselves. To deceive ourselves into approaching sin, but not going quite all the way. And normally what happens, because we are flawed individuals, we are flawed human beings, is that we wind up crossing that line anyway. So instead of tempting us to go out, for example, if the sin that you're struggling with is lust, to go out and seek a fornication with somebody with whom you are not married, he doesn't really tempt you with that. He tempts you with, I just, just look at this picture of this attractive person wearing very little clothing. They're not even really naked. Just look at them a little bit and, and then, you know, linger a little bit. And we lie to ourselves and believe that we're spiritually strong enough to engage in an activity that's kind of sinful and then not take it any further than we really do. And then we turn around and we realize we're way off the path that we started. 
we're way far away from where we originally started and where that initial temptation took place. This is something that David himself would have been familiar with. We remember the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. Where did that start out? How did that whole episode begin? Because David, presumably by accident, saw her bathing on a rooftop, and he didn't look away. He lied to himself. He convinced himself that he was spiritually strong enough to continue watching her and not fall further into sin. And I think that when we're talking about sanctification, this idea of purifying ourselves of sin and trying our best to stay faithful and stay according to God's word and to follow it, we have to also remember that in order to accomplish this, we have to be honest with ourselves about our own limitations. I think that that's one of the reasons that it is specifically stated in the psalm this way. So let's go ahead and look at verses 5 and 6. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. So right here, he asks, what are the requirements to receive this blessing? It's in the verses that we just looked at, right? That we serve God and we have pure hands and a clean heart, and we are not filled with deceit or vanity. And then he's saying, And the reaction by God to that is that that person will receive blessings from God and to the God of his salvation. Notice that this blessing is not exclusive to Israel. If you're looking through that passage, what are the requirements to receive salvation and to receive God's blessing according to this psalm? Doesn't say anything about being a Hebrew, doesn't say anything about being an Israelite. Somebody that is willing to serve and cleans their hands and purifies their hearts and cast away untruthfulness and deceit and vanity. I think that that's really significant here because, of course, while David is specifically talking about somebody who would have been qualified to serve in the capacity of returning the ark to its rightful place, and that would have not only had to have been a Jew, but actually a Levite, somebody that was specifically charged with keeping the law of Moses— I think it's important to note that what David is emphasizing here is not something that would be exclusive to the children of Israel. And this is something that unfortunately gets often mischaracterized in skeptics of the Bible. They kind of try to make this argument that God is tribal and he plays favorites and he was really only concerned with Israel at the time that he didn't have any concern for the other people living in the world, and then that was essentially rewritten when Christ comes along. I'm sorry, but that is not the case. We see over and over again that God is primarily concerned with the spiritual well-being of people, not necessarily just their bloodline. Now, it's true that God had a special relationship with them in a way that he did not have a relationship with others. But the overall point here is God is chiefly concerned with their spiritual well-being, and he's saying that those that are willing to follow me and to purify themselves, remove sin, and worship me, those people are going to be blessed. So I think it's an important distinction that we bring up here, and I think that this is foreshadowing the kingdom. It is foreshadowing a time where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, that all that are willing to come to God and worship him and obey him will be found cleansed. And so I think there's an important aspect of foreshadowing here when it comes to the New Testament. So why are these the standards for blessing? Why is this the standard that is presented by David? David was a king, somebody that presumably had quite a few servants, Do you think a king would let somebody serve him if they had dirty hands? Think about that. Would a king let somebody, for example, prepare his food and bring it to them if they refused to wash his hands? I mean, I think that we can pretty easily answer that. I mean, I get a little bit skeptical when I walk into a restaurant and they've got anything below an 85 on the health score. So this is something that we should all be able to relate to, right? Somebody that is willing to serve should also have a certain level of of purity and sanctification, and it is certainly true that no king 
would have allowed a servant to show up looking unkempt or unpresentable. And God is no different. He expects a certain level of spiritual purification when we come before him. And I love this analogy that C.S. Lewis uses in The Four Loves. One of the analogies that he uses, and he's talking about the love of man and animal, is he equates mankind to a dog. And he says that when the dog first starts out, when it's a puppy and it's being brought into the house, for a while, the master may tolerate some bad behavior and be a little bit more forgiving. But as that puppy matures into a full-grown dog, he takes strides to train it to live in a way that is clean and acceptable to the master. This is not because he dislikes the dog. He likes the dog very much, and that's why he's trying to change it. He's trying to train it so that it will understand there are certain ways that are acceptable for you to be brought into my household. There are certain things that you have to do and certain things you must not do to be able to dwell among me. And he says that God in many ways is the same same way. That he tells us very clearly there are certain things that are acceptable and certain things that are not acceptable if you are going to dwell in my presence. And while he may be a little bit uh, more understanding of those failings, and we see this sometimes in the epistles even, that after a certain level, we're supposed to be consuming spiritual meat, and we're supposed to mature to the point to where we can be better servants towards God. And the dog analogy works pretty well here. So let's go ahead and and read the remainder of the chapter here in Psalm uh, 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Salah. So the language here implies that there is a conquering king returning to a city. Now, there's an obvious parallel here if this is indeed a psalm that was written for the return of the Ark of the Covenant. Because as as was pointed out recently, to a Jewish person, the Ark of the Covenant is where God was. That he resided between the cherubims on the mercy seat. And so, there's obviously a parallel that God, who is the king of Israel, is returning to his city, returning to his rightful place when the Ark of the Covenant is brought back. But it's important to understand the historic context here. When a king returned to a city, when a king had come back from war or whatever else that he had been away from, the coming back process was something to be celebrated. The entire city would open up the gates for the king to return. And there was usually a festival and a parade, this kind of thing. And there was great celebration in the city that the king had returned home. And this is sort of a similar sentiment that that David is trying to drum up, that he's trying to sort of paint a mental picture to those that are singing this song of God coming back to his city in the same way that a king returns to his city and there is great celebration in his homecoming. And you'll notice also that in this passage, the gatekeepers are being told to make ready to let him in. So there is a, a sense that the gatekeepers are being warned, hey, the king is on his way. It is time to let the gates come open because the king is coming and we want to be ready for him. So that's sort of the symbolism that we have here. How does this relate to us? What is the parallel between this imagery that David is using and the relationship that we have with God? Oh, absolutely. I think that's exactly correct that if we are supposed to be the dwelling place of God, if God is supposed to reside in us, then we are the city. And the message of the gospel is the king is coming. And so because of that, we need to make ourselves ready to have Jesus come and dwell in us, and we need to make it like David is describing here, a great celebration of joy that the king is coming home to his rightful place in our heart that we do go through the preparations, and of course the, the plan of salvation is the way to do that that is laid out in the Gospels. But the overall idea is that we are rejoicing that the King has come to dwell with us. 
And Christ is a conquering king, is he not? Someone that has conquered death, and because of that conquering, now dwells within us. So just like the symbolism of a king returning from war who has has gone out and conquered and returning in glory, so Christ is to come into us as the conqueror of death to reside in our hearts. And I also want you to notice too, the gatekeepers are told to let him in. And so this isn't a conquering king that's conquering an enemy city. The gatekeepers are to let him in. One thing that you'll notice about Christ in the gospel narratives is that he never stays anywhere very long that he is not wanted. That this is a willing process, that we have to want God to dwell in us for him to dwell here, because if we don't want him here, he's not going to be here. And the same is true of this, uh, this symbolism that we're letting Christ in to dwell in us, because that we see that as his rightful place. And you'll also notice that the focus is on the king and his greatness, not the gatekeeper. The gatekeepers are a part of, the, part of this process, sure. They're the ones that open up the gate. And those are the ones that, that David is imploring here to open that gate. But the focus isn't on them. The focus is on the king. That's what everybody's looking at. And so because of that, even though we are the ones that are allowing God to come and dwell in us because he's not going to force himself on us, We should really remember that even though we're a part of that process, it's not about us. We're not the ones that people should be focusing on. When there is a process by which other people can see Christ dwelling within us, we need to make sure to take the emphasis off of ourselves. Because what they really should be seeing and what we should really be emphasizing is not that the gates opened, but that the gates are opening because the king is coming home. And so if we focus on that, I think that will uh, help us immensely in this. So remember, if we're looking back to the the middle part of this psalm, that only the clean and pure-hearted are worthy to enter God's presence. And so this is kind of where we're going to tie everything together here. If that is the case, then who is worthy to enter? Well, since that's the bell, I guess I'll just go ahead and give you the answer. Uh, It's Christ, because we're certainly not worthy. We're certainly not clean. We know that from Romans 5.12, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, we require a way to be purified. We cannot enter into the city. We cannot enter into God's presence without the purifying blood of Jesus Christ doing that work. And one thing that was common back then in this analogy that that David is using of a king returning to his city is that the gates didn't open for just anybody. If they opened, it was a big event. They were letting someone specific in. And so it would not be uncommon for a city that's gates were normally shut and closed to outsiders to open up for a king. And because there was a big festival, you could follow the king into the city. And so there's another side to this analogy, that if we want to enter into the dwelling place, the holy place of God that David starts this symbolism out with, there's only one way to get in. We have to follow Christ. And that sort of solidified in in John 14, 6, where Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. If we wanted to get into the city, if we want to dwell in God's holy place and have a communion with him, there's only one way to do it, and that's by following the king into the city. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.